welcome to Transformative Principle, where I help you stop putting out fires and start leading. I'm your host, Jethro Jones. You can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. For several years now, I've been helping schools implement trauma-informed strategies in their schools. Now, as students are starting to come back to school, the need for this is greater than ever. Here's the thing. I'm not a social worker, and I don't pretend to be. So my training really focuses on practical strategies that you can implement in your school without making your teachers feel like they have to be social workers also. I help schools implement trauma-informed strategies so that fewer discipline referrals, fewer dysregulated students, and a calmer, more focused atmosphere. And the best thing is, this training aligns perfectly with ESSER funding, so you don't have to take it out of your school budget. My clients report that they have better sense of how to help their students without adding another thing to their plate. Go to jethrojones.com slash trauma to read more about it, and let's schedule a chat. That's jethrojones.com slash trauma. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am honored today to have Judith Warner with me. She's the author of a new book, And Then They Stopped Talking to Me, Making Sense of Middle School, which is where my heart is. So I'm happy to have her on today. She has published eight previous works of nonfiction, including the New York Times bestseller, Perfect Madness, Motherhood in the Age of Anxiety, and also Hillary Clinton, The Inside Story, plus multiple award-winning We've Got Issues, uh, Children and Parents in the Age of Medication. She's also a longtime New York Times contributor, best known for a popular column, D- Domestic Disturbances. A former special correspondent for Newsweek in Paris, she has lived in Washington, D.C. for 20 years with her husband and two daughters and speaks frequently on American family life, workplace issues, and mental health. Judith, welcome to Transformative Principle. Thanks so glad. Oh, gosh. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> the end of the day is the end of the day. Oh, Yeah. It, sure. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very glad to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to have you also. Many people who know me know that I have always said that middle school is the place to be as an educator. And so I'm very excited about this conversation. But one thing that you said didn't really surprise me, but I totally understand is that almost everybody hates middle school. Why is that? People, you know, think back on middle school usually as the worst or weirdest, most awkward, embarrassing, painful period of their lives. Most people, not all. I mean, there's a sizable minority who don't, but that tends to be the default reaction. And it also tends to be a subject that people just want to run away from. You know, when I would say I was writing this book, very often they would just sort of like throw up their hands and say, reaching hormones, and then kind of try to disappear. Again, it's kind of like a programmed reaction, I think, at this point. No, I think it is. And when I tell people that I was a middle school principal and that I loved being in the middle school, people would always say, wow, you are crazy or there must be something wrong with you because no normal person would ever say that. So many educators have told me that. And they've also said that that really bugs them because, you know, it makes them feel bad because they actually like what they do. You know, they're not crazy. It's a choice. And they love working with that age group and also because they feel like it's so unfair toward the kids. But again, it's like a programmed reaction. That's the default. Well, and what I love about it is that it's an age where you can you have a brand new experience every single day. No matter how the kids were the day before, there's a very good chance they're going to be the complete opposite the next day. And to me, that's part of the fun of middle school. So uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is not only does it does it leave an impression on people, but their experience is, is much more memorable than other parts of schooling. Um, why is that such a memorable time for most people? Partly it's because it's a difficult time and many people do have things happen to them in that period that are really painful and that, you know, make a big impression on them. And partly though, it's for biological reasons. Because along with the physical changes of puberty that we commonly think of for that age, there are brain changes that people tend not to be as aware of 
but that sort of rev up the parts of the brain that have to do with memory, among other things, and mean that the things that happen to you at that age are actually held on to in a more deeply felt and more, you know, sort of exquisitely remembered way. And that's a really interesting perspective also. You know, things have changed a lot from when you and I were in middle school, but a lot of the same things have happened. What are some of the things that you've seen that have changed and how should we deal with that now? And by and large, I was surprised by the degree to which things hadn't changed, actually. We, I felt like going into being a middle school parent, that for years I'd been reading or just vaguely hearing about how things were going to be so different and so dangerous and just unimaginably awful, you know, with stranger danger now online and new and horrible degrees of cruelty and sexual stuff, all the rest. I mean, all the things that parents fear. And what I found was that the kids struck me as being so similar to what I remembered. And if anything, and this is backed up by research, Their lives were safer and in many ways kind of globally kinder because of the ways that social attitudes had changed than life had been when I was, you know, 11, 12, 13. So that that actually was surprising to me. And that was a couple of years before I started writing the book that I that I first had that impression as a middle school parent. But in addition, what I did find had changed a lot uh, were the parents. The role of parents, the self-conception of parents, and the degree to which parents got involved in their kids' lives. That was completely different. I mean, I may be a little older than you. I, you know, I, I think we're both Gen Xers, but I'm at the older end of that. And the common memory slash complaint of people my age and a little bit older is that our parents were too absent caught up in themselves and their own stuff and just not really emotionally present. Well, and the book is written from the perspective of a parent of middle schoolers, not necessarily from a kid's perspective. So I I think that that understanding of how parenting has changed so much is, is really fascinating. And certainly it just in my time in education, it changed dramatically from parents allowing their kids to go out a lot more frequently to kids having very little time away from their parents, uh, whether it's organized sports, which I also saw an increase in or, or other activities where parents were involved. There's a lot less time away from parents. Do you think that that affects how middle schoolers develop their own sense of self and identity? I think it makes it a whole lot harder. And I think that it cuts out many opportunities for what's best about being that age or what can be best about being that age, which is the ability to explore, you know, whether it's for me, it was actually physically exploring New York City with my best friend going out and seeing new neighborhoods and new stores, you know, and stores are are so fascinating at that age because the stuff that we've seen over and over again, everything is fresh and new. Or the ability to explore even new books and ideas or what, whatever, whatever it is, new activities, new friends, things that just happen outside of the realm of what parents have set up, what parents have created, what parents like or don't like. You know, that's really what the age traditionally has been all about, finding out who you are kind of by trial and error. And a lot of that opportunity has has been removed now because parents are so much more present and so much more fearful. So life in general has contributed to that fearfulness that that parents are experiencing. What would you say are the things that have contributed the most to that? You know, stranger danger was a big issue when when we were younger and we all thought that someone was going to kidnap us at the park. And I don't feel like parents feel that so much now. They have other fears. What what fears are you do you see driving them and why are they feeling that way? That's such a good question and such a complicated one. I mean, I think that what drives some of the fear are media reports and books and movies, but really really more news media reports, you know, that 
again, going back for decades now, have just kind of painted this age group as, I don't know, being on the precipice of sin all the time. And, you know, in whatever form that often was drawn from the bigger news of the day, like the Monica Lewinsky moment led to a whole slew of stories that were focused on one particular activity. You know, there have been different things at different times. I think it's also, of course, driven by parents' memories of suffering and the fear that their children will suffer the way that they did. And I think it is really on a deep level driven by the social anxieties that we as adults, you know, have today, the the worries about status, about falling behind, about our kids falling behind, about they're not finding their place as easily maybe as we did in a world that's become so stratified and so unequal. Um, you know, that's the stuff that isn't necessarily stated outright or isn't, you know, written about in an obvious way in the news, but there's an undercurrent of it in, in everything that parents experience, I think, now when their kids are all different ages. But it kind of comes to a head in the early adolescent period for reasons probably that are almost atavistic. I mean, that have been in place for generations and generations because early adolescence simply is the point at which we, our ancestors, other primates, you know, start to break away from their parents and start to embark on whatever is going to be their, our own path in life. Yeah, well, and thank you for teaching me a new word. Atavistic means relating to or characterized by reversion to something ancient or ancestral or multi-generational. I appreciate you uh, helping me learn a new word today. Thank you. That's, that's always exciting for me. So uh, taking that piece into consideration, part of the, the challenge I feel is that parents have thought that there was a certain way to be successful in life. And, and it seems like that that guarantee of success is not the same as it was um, before. And maybe we're just becoming more aware than our parents were. Maybe we're recognizing that their idea of success is not the same as our idea of success. And so we want our kids to be successful in different ways, more unique, their own ways. Um, but I think there's also this, this idea that every parent wants to believe that their child is the special, unique chosen one when that can be hard to see your child falling into the same behaviors or patterns that you fell into at that same age. And, and that maybe there's some overcorrection of trying to prevent them from, from doing some of the same things that we did when we were younger. Talk about that. Absolutely. I think there are all sorts of forms of overcorrection and also of sometimes wanting them to be on the same path, actually. You know, if you yourself had a path in middle school that allowed, or junior high, depending on how old you are, that allowed you to be successful, let's say, and get through relatively unscathed, you generalize it to being the path that, you know, you want your kid to be on because it's what you know. And I think a lot of what has to do with success stems from that same impulse. You want the best for them and you know what you know in terms of what worked. And it's really easy to lose sight of the fact that they are separate people living in a separate time, different personality, different circumstances. It's kind of scary to have to accept that, in fact, they're embarking into the unknown and you really kind of have to step back and watch things unfold because it, it all doesn't work otherwise. I just wanted to say just for one second, thank you. Thank you for uh, being so kind about my use of atavistic, which could be seen as um, pretentious and which I overuse. I think I probably learned the word, you know, not all that long ago either. And it's sort of my favorite fallback yeah. word now, you know, like a, like a middle schooler who's learned something, l learned a sophisticated <laughs> new word or phrase. Well, no, um, I, I think that's great. I'm glad that, glad that you took a second to acknowledge that. Cause I think that that's important also, because as we see middle school age kids get really excited about what they learn. And, you know, that often leads to them thinking that they know everything when they give that impression, but they really don't.
John Cat Educational supports high-quality teaching and learning by providing publications that are research-based, practical, and focused on the key topics proven essential in today's and tomorrow's schools. The latest John Cat publications include a book whose bold, transformative ideas amaze and infuriate people around the world, according to one reviewer, a title from Global Leaders in Curriculum Planning, Practice, and Retrieval, one book that says stop talking and start doing with regard to teacher well-being, and much more. These books, used by educators of all roles across North America and worldwide, amplify fresh, engaging voices with practical strategies to create transformative change. Learn more in our show notes at jethrojones.com slash podcast. But then that also begs the question, what did you learn about yourself after researching and writing this book in particular? Nothing good. You know, that kind of learning about myself started before I started working on the book in that when my older daughter, I combined them into one daughter in the book, but I can't do that in, in talking, got to middle school and I was just kind of observing the different kinds of people. And as I said, the fact that they all looked very familiar to me, they, did, they were not these new terrifying creatures. And I realized that the ones who, the girls who reminded me of myself, were not necessarily the very nice ones. And that was very disturbing, frankly. You know, the ones who I felt like I could identify with and and who were very readable to me. And that, you know, that doesn't feel great. And then I also had the experience, just as I was kind of gearing up for the book, of coming upon this long document, which is basically, I think, a response to some kind of questionnaire that somebody that I think a camp friend sent me that my mother came across when she was cleaning out her apartment. And it's basically like 30 pages, very neatly handwritten, because that's what I was like at the time, all about me, you know, what my tastes are, what my, you know, opinion of this, that, and the next thing, what my relationships are like. And it was funny to see that the sort of personality traits that people disliked in me at the time in which I didn't believe I had came through very clearly in that. Um, and that that was disappointing because that and then also other feedback I got from one friend in particular who I'd known at that age and had, you know, quote unquote, dropped. It all, all of that worked together to to show me that my memories were not really accurate. You know, I had gone forward from middle school into adulthood with, um, with the story of victimization uh, that was really dominated by the experience that inspired the title of the book of coming into school one day to find that my friend group had stopped talking to me. And then by extension, no one was talking to me and no one would tell me why. And it was absolutely terrifying and devastating. I mean, that's what stayed with me. Every insult, every anything, you know, stayed with me. But what I had forgotten was, or more kind of rem- not remembered, let's say, as opposed to forgetting altogether, was the things that I had done to other people or the ways that I had contributed to what had happened to me. And that was such an important insight, actually. Because I think that it is so much more empowering if a kid at that age can become aware of what they're doing to contribute to a situation in which they just feel victimized, as most tend to do, because it gives them the opportunity to change, to grow, to be aware of themselves as agents in social situations, as opposed to just being people who are acted upon. Yeah, that that ability of us to take action rather than being acted upon is a lifelong lesson that, you know, we, we grow in degrees, you know, like an onion, we go through layers of understanding what that really means. And it's, it's very powerful. And, you know, some people never grow out of the victimization stage and they stay there for the, you know, well into their adulthood and believe that they are the victim of everything else. So it, understanding that, that we bring these things with us and we become adults and then we have kids and we our perception of middle school can have an influence on how kids experience middle school themselves. And, you know, as someone who's excited and loves middle school, I feel like I've set my, my kids up 
very successfully for that because it's fun and it's exciting and you meet new people and you lose friends and you gain friends and, and that's all just part of it. And that's okay. How do you see parents' perceptions influencing their kids' experiences? Well, I think that when parents, as the ones around me generally did, view the advent of middle school as an enormous threat, you know, a danger that's looming, the worst years of their kids' lives being about to start and one that they have to defend against at all costs, it certainly doesn't help, you know, and it, whether they say all of this or just kind of, you know, emit it, um, the kids pick up on it. And it it really doesn't help in terms of their having a kind of lighter attitude to what goes on at that age and being able to sort of see what's a big deal and what isn't a big deal. You know, as you just said, like, you know, you'll make new friends, leave other friends and all that's OK. You know, we as parents don't tend to see it that way. Right. We hear our, our children's pain, you know, if they're the ones who are kind of left behind by another friend who maybe is moving in a different direction or at a different speed and their pain is is huge and we second it basically as we have a tendency to do that you know because we really do feel for them and because we think we should be validating them above all whereas in reality what we kind of need to do is what we do when our kids are little and we know that if they fall down and start crying If they're not really hurt, you know, we want to convey to them that they're okay. It's all right. Yeah. You know, it's bad right now, but it's not such a big deal. It's very, very hard for most of us to do that. And I think, you know, it's the fact that you're an educator and you are very knowledgeable about this age group that makes it possible for for you to do that. I think that to the extent that the rest of us come to it at all, it's kind of like we have to educate ourselves and train ourselves to get there. Very interesting. Um, so I'm I'm sure that you came across some absolutely bonkers stories about things that people did, it, adults did in response to their middle school kids situations. Can you share some of those stories? Absolutely. These were the kinds of stories that put me on the track to writing the book in the first place, you know, because I just I had been around the same group of parents for a long time, and I saw a change come over them when middle school started. You know, the sort of general chumminess, we're all in it together, you know, sharing our worries or fears. All of that went away. People became much more guarded and defensive, really wanted to keep up a good face for their kids and for themselves, but also became distrustful of one another and in certain ways started acting like middle schoolers in terms of helping maintain clicks, make sure that, you know, click stuff played out the way their kids wanted, sort of furthering their social ambitions and becoming markedly less empathetic toward other kids than they had been in the past. I mean, it was a striking change. And when I started talking to other parents for the book and I spoke to as many, you know, as I could, while still leaving aside some time for writing, I heard stories that were much wilder than whatever it was that I had experienced. Parents literally micromanaging their kids' social lives in order to get them to be in the group that they wanted, whether it was through carpooling or even, I mean, engineering seats at the table for a birthday party. Or, you know, in some cases, there was a case that a school principal told me about where A group of parents had decided that there was a certain girl in the class was the mean girl. One of the parents created like a false profile and started monitoring the social media goings on and even getting involved in pushing back and sort of bullying the bully while at the same time denouncing her, you know, to the principal. I mean, stories like that where just the boundaries would dissolve. Uh, Parents gossiping, calling 12-year-old girls sluts because of the ways they dressed. You know, just things that when we have younger kids, we know are inappropriate, that we just, we don't do things like that by and large. But something happens when our kids get to be middle school age and all bets are off. Well, and it kind of seems like the the stakes are raised and that's what 
causes people to do that. And I, I had a situation where some parents were, were actively talking about taking out a restraining order against one of the other kids in the school because they were like stealing someone's boyfriend or girlfriend. I don't remember all the details, but it was something around that. And it was like, if you're, because you're doing this, we're going to take out a restraining order. You can't be around my daughter who's currently dating this boy so that uh, there can't be any chance for you to steal the boy from my daughter. And it's like, holy cow, what is going on, people? That's the kind of story that just blows my mind. And yet everybody has one like that, especially I think, you know, school principals who hear it all, right? Because people come to them, parents come to them when they're in some kind of situation that they think needs a higher level of of attention. I'm curious, I assume that when this was brought to you, I don't know if it was brought to you by the parents or by others, if you intervened to sort of say, this is crazy, how people reacted. Yeah, parents never like the school principal getting involved in their family dynamics and drama if they think the school principal's in the wrong. So the families that are being treated poorly or pushed aside love it when the school gets involved and the families that are pushing aside and being mean to others really do not like it. And so that is very typically what happens. And in this case, I didn't get involved at all because I just heard about it after the fact and it had, uh, they had gone through that process and the police had been involved and said, look, you don't file a restraining order against somebody who, so that she can't steal your daughter's boyfriend. That's just not what this system is for. And I just heard about it later. So I don't, I don't know all the details or anything like that. And I, I certainly didn't get involved. And I said, thank heavens the policeman was involved in that instead of me, because that is much better. I just can't even that, that I think that story is maybe tops, you know, my story. That one just blows my mind. Or maybe (laughs) it's just that actually I haven't heard it before. So it has its full shock potential. You know, I think of a similar story that someone told me where there was a boyfriend stealing issue that also involved tearing up a piece of art that was hung in the hallway and the terror upper got suspended for doing that. And then though, in addition, was completely stigmatized by the kids. And when she was going to come back to school, um, she got a threatening note and something that was filled with dog poop and envelope dropped off at their home and was really pretty traumatized by this, needed therapy, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, the kids did move on. They worked it out. But the mom told me that she was completely excluded from her friend group from that point on. And it was because she hadn't reached out quickly enough to the mother of the girl whose art had been torn up. She did eventually reach out. But, um, you know, she was very much involved in sort of taking care of her daughter who was traumatized and needing serious help. And so a little bit of time went by and that time was deemed inexcusable by the mom in question. And so everyone had turned their backs on her because they couldn't go up against the mom in question. Just this, this replication of middle school dynamics among you know, 40 something professionals that should know better. Right. <laughs> I mean, you would, they should know better. But that, yeah, they should. Exactly. Yeah. So what, what is a, a practical tip that you can give to a parent who, or a principal who might be dealing with something like this and what, what can they do to diffuse the situation or, or take it down a notch so that it's not so high stakes? First of all, take a deep breath and get yourself to a place of calm. Because if you're feeling highly emotional, which you probably will, right? Because this can be so triggering and you do care about your children so much. But if you're emotionally riled up, you're going to be useless. So take a deep breath and wait until your kind of more rational brain is is back online. And then be the grown up. Listen, you know, listen to your child and show that you're actively listening and hearing whatever pain that they're in. But then get them to think on a higher level, get them to sort of take a broader perspective in thinking about what are different angles, you know, through which you can look at what's going on. Maybe something's going on with, let's say, the other, another kid who's doing something to you, 
I'm leaving out like outright horrific bullying. I'm talking about the more kind of general crummy stuff, you know, that that really commonly happens in middle school. And then think with them, ask them to think about what they can do to make things better. Do they need to find someone at school, an adult at school to talk about it with, you know, who can help them problem solve? Whether it's a school counselor or a teacher they're especially close to, some adults at school who they feel close to and who they think has a good sense of things and and has good judgment. That's the best place to start. And if you want to send a a kind of heads up email to that person, you know, just to say this is going on, I told her or him to come talk to you to try to problem solve around it. That's great because then at least they, they can get prepared on their end. But not reaching out to say, you know, so-and-so is a monster and is bullying if they're not actually bullying, you know, which is something specific, Um, my child, and, you know, not demanding punitive action, but just asking for help in problem solving. That is the best thing that you can do because the adults at school are trained for this. They're knowledgeable about this age group. They're also much more aware of what's going on with all the kids than you can possibly be, you know, because you have just a narrow perspective. And in whatever form, if they can help your child figure out how to not just feel better, but be more empowered in the situation, then you'll have done something really good. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I want to thank you for being part of Transformative Principle today. Again, the book is, and then they stop talking to me, making sense of middle school. You can get that wherever books are sold and also judithwarner.com. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Hey, middle school principals. What if I told you that all your teachers had to do to teach your students really valuable social and emotional competencies was just press play in control sel is a fully automated video curriculum that teachers and students absolutely love and that's because it's easy and it looks just like a netflix or a youtube show so all you have to do to hear about how it can completely transform your school is schedule your call tell us jethro sent you and you'll get 20 percent off if you feel like it's a good fit so go now to www.incontrolsel.com slash strategy call to schedule your call today The link will be in the show notes.